Suspension on gravel bikes is a thing. And it's fair to say that these guys, Lauf, are probably the pioneers. Certainly they are the most distinctive. Once you've seen a Lauf fork, you will definitely remember it. And they're based right here in Iceland. And when they found out that we were over here to do some riding, they've invited us to come and hang out and they'll hopefully explain a little bit more about how this works. They're based right here in downtown Reykjavik, the capital city of Iceland. Population at just 128,000 people, 200,000 in the wider capital district, and that's two thirds of the entire population of the country. Now you might get the idea, if you can see the amount of Gore-Tex being worn around here, that it is a little bit chilly, but don't make the mistake, it is in fact late summer. And they are just in here. No, that's, that's the pub, up a bit. No, that's the tattoo parlor, up a bit more. There you go, look. Lay off, up there. We caught up with the guys here yesterday evening for pizza and beers, so they should be expecting us. Hello, morning. Hey, all right, this is Lauf coming in. So we've got Goodberg here. Hey man, morning, you're right. And Benedict, so these guys are the founders of Lauf, and Ole over there is working on sales, right? Cool. And you also have three people out of the office on like gravel bike duties, bike riding? Yeah, yeah they're racing yeah, in the fun. US and Belgium. Yeah. Yeah. Nice, yeah. so six people in total at the moment. Yeah, usually only like three or four right here, but yeah, yeah the other people's traveling and yeah, yeah, yeah. visiting shops and, and doing races. Right then, a quick tour. So in here, we've got workshop. In there, we've got a little test lab. Then of course, clearly, workspace. What I particularly like, guys, is the fact that there is less workspace than there is socializing space, because we've got a bar over there, and we've got a kitchen. And then in here, I'm just gonna give you a very quick rundown, just to make sure that you know exactly what Lauf do. So, the forks. Already seen these. So this is the mountain bike fork, the TR Boost. That was product number one, although this is the second iteration of it. Then the Carbonara for fat bikes, clearly. And then, of most relevance to us, I think, it's the Grit fork. So this is the gravel bike fork. And then now, the Grit SL, which is the latest version of the gravel bike fork. And this very excitingly, which is their first complete bike as well. So this is the True Grit, their own frame set, and we'll find out a little bit more about that later on. First though, we want to know, how does that work? Benedict, can you explain please firstly how forks work, the basic principle behind it? Uh, so yeah, basically it's all about uh, controlling flex. Okay. To get flex is, is pretty easy. You just use a soft material, basically, basically then you have a flexy component. Uh, but to control the movement of the tire, that was the the real challenge. So that's why we have, uh, that's why we came up with this exact design, having the springs like spaced apart. So a lower stack of springs and an upper stack of springs. This gives it like lateral stiffness. Okay. So that's the whole idea. Yeah. Okay. And so, so the axle of the wheel is, is there and yeah. then those are leaf springs, am I right? Yeah, those are leaf springs, yeah. And uh, so the path of the axle is literally straight up, straight yeah, down? Yeah, pretty much straight. Yeah, it's gonna, initially it's gonna move slightly backwards, slow, perpendicular to the surface of the springs, but then it's gonna straighten out a little bit so it makes it extra sensitive in the beginning towards small bumps and then it straightens out. I so, mean, do you call each yeah. one of those a spring? Like uh, yeah, 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 okay. leaf springs, yeah, yeah that, because that's what they are, yeah. So a lot of people think they are carbon springs uh, and we don't bother uh, correcting that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's happening everywhere in reviews all over the internet. Uh, but if we would use carbon fiber for it, it would be way too brittle. It would just snap uh, on, on a big impact. Okay. Uh, so the material we use is, is like a super high performance glass fiber. Okay. Uh, so it's done in the same way as, as uh, carbon fiber in bikes, you have epoxy and then you have the fibers. Yeah. We just have glass fiber instead of carbon fiber. And yeah, that this fiber can flex maybe twice as far or yeah, at least twice as far as regular carbon and it just won't break. Yeah, so these uh, were samples we made uh, back in the days just to fatigue test springs. Okay. 
but they also do a good job of explaining uh, why the fork kind of looks as it does. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if you just have, let's say if you make a normal-ish looking fork, uh, but you want to make it really forgiving, so you would make it slim uh, in, in some dimensions to make it yeah, forgiving towards impacts. Uh, then you basically end up with this system. So it can flex like this, and it, but it can twist also. Like you can feel this. This is yeah, really noodly. So, it is. Yeah. So very yeah, noodly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, well, you, so you just cut one of your springs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It didn't, it didn't okay. break. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> it don't break. Okay. <laughs> no, no worries. Uh, so here is yeah how we arrange them. This is yeah not the full distance as you can see compared yeah. to the fork, but still just this short distance gives you a really stiff feel. Okay. So, this is what. Yeah. Now I don't have the biggest muscles. GCM yeah. viewers know this, but still, that's quite incredible, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. I guess one of the important things is to note that there is less travel on a yeah. lap fork than yeah. on a telescopic yeah. fork. So on the grit gravel fork, it's what 32 mm. Uh, right? It's uh, close to 30, so it's like 25, 30. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then on the on the mountain bike forks, it's what 60 mm. Double that roughly. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, they, they, sh they should never go further up than that. Uh, two reasons. Uh, uh, it would be, I mean, it would be a huge fork when you need to have these really long springs, and, and uh, the weight is gonna approach somewhat uh, telescopic forks. Uh, so just construction-wise, it wouldn't make a lot of sense, but also just the function of it, uh, because the response of our forks uh, make them better suited at dealing with small hits. So the high frequency stuff gets like ironed out, Yeah. Uh, but like slower and bigger impacts, it won't do much for that. Can you talk me through and show me some of the early prototypes? Yeah, 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 let's yeah, come over here to our uh, prototyping department. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Now, if I was to guess, I'd say yeah. that that was probably <laughs> an early prototype. Benedict, is that? Yeah. So this is uh, this is the first uh, writable, uh, in a way, yeah. prototype. And this is this is not light. Uh, and, 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 and think about it. Here we were trying to make the lightest suspension fork in the world. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't feel like it. <laughs> no. So what have you made it out of? Uh, so this is yeah aluminum everything, but but up here we have like a kilo of steel. So yeah, this fork tested just the, the main concept, uh, yeah, guiding the tire up and down. Uh, but obviously we had to work on the weight <laughs> yeah. a bit. Uh, so next logical step was to make it out of uh, carbon. Okay. Uh, and that's so where... Presumably, like, that's your passion, the composites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was proof about. of concept, but yeah. it was always going to be about yeah, yeah, carbon yeah, exactly. fiber. Yeah. Uh, so this is the first carbon fork we made. So this was made just yeah here in house by us up in the attic here in, in yeah. a small room we could borrow there. Uh, and and we were yeah after work we were yeah coming here and, and cutting cutting carbon prepreg uh, and, and and laying up into molds and then and inflating bladders uh, in the part to to cure it in an oven. We we also built I can show you afterwards really big oven we made. We built an oven. Yeah, like a huge oven, and, and we carried it up to the fifth floor, up a small, like a like a round staircase up there. It was really tricky to get it up, but but yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is this is a mold for yeah our next iteration after the one I showed you previously. Yeah, yeah, this one here. Okay. And here we are focusing on how to make the pockets for the springs, the attachment pockets. So we make those with these inserts here. So so these here. Bastards are, are used <laughs> in, in the layer process, uh, so you like yeah attach them to the fork and lay up all around uh, these yeah. Wow, these cones. that looks like quite you know fine work. Yeah, yeah, yes it is. Does that headset race show a bit about the weather in Iceland, by the way? That looks, <laughs> that looks like the kind of thing that comes out of my cyclocross bike at the end of the winter. Yeah, maybe it does. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this is normal to me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. That's what bearings look like after two weeks in Iceland. Yeah. The key thing was to make something really simple and lightweight, something to be in fall in between rigid forks and telescopic forks, and part of that is zero maintenance. Yeah. So there are no pivots or nothing. So. As long as we design the springs and make them properly uh, to make them last forever, which they do in our latest forks, they, they work forever. And, and if not, we have a yeah, really long warranty on them. Uh, but nothing can fail in this. It's just, yeah, and, and you don't have to maintain anything. It just, yeah, goes and goes. Yeah. How do you test the springs then? Can you just talk me through like, yeah, some, uh, of the, some of the tests that you 
Yeah, we you do a lot of tests. Uh, we uh, in your most yeah most important fatigue right? testing. Yeah, can show you. Yeah, that. let's get yeah, for it. Yeah, Come on, let's yeah, have a look. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty strong stuff, isn't it? So yeah, this is. Uh, the room uh, we do a lot of our testing in. I tell you what, it looks more like a torture chamber than <laughs> the most. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dare I ask what? So yeah, this is uh, yeah torture machine. I mean, yeah, fatigue testing and testing in general is, is torture. Oh, of I see. It's like a rolling components. road. That's yeah, your yeah, yeah, yes. We call it the hamster wheel. Uh, this one, uh, and we mount the fork up here with a tire and all. Just a complete test because most of the tests, uh, for example, done at our venter, uh, and with testing, uh, testing. Uh, yeah, testers, basically official bike component testers. Uh, they focus on just the part itself. Here we wanted to test it with the wheel and everything, yeah. just to be completely sure. Uh, and then, yeah, then we just make different bumps here and, and then make it rotate at different speeds and, and hit, the, hit the wheel here. Yeah, so this is, uh, from the length of it, I'm gonna guess that this is probably a gravel fork spring here. Uh -huh. uh, so we flex them to roughly 70% of like where we have the bump stop on the fork. Yeah. Uh, and we need them to do, uh, require them to do 100,000 cycles of that uh, without losing 10% in, in original stiffness. Okay. A lot of it goes into just quality controlling what we do here because always when we make uh, springs with our vendor in, in, in Europe, uh, they, they make springs and, and send us a sample of it and, and the remainder goes uh, to our uh, fork vendor in Asia. Ah, okay. So we always test what they are producing forks out of. Uh, but this has probably taken us about four years to really dial in how to make it because it's really tricky. You need to maintain like pressure while you're curing it, but at the same time you need to have exact, really, really exact thickness of it. If it's off by just 0.1 millimeter, you get a way different stiffness and it just, yeah, it's unrideable, too soft or too hard. Given, you know, the, the you've kind of brought technology to cycling, maybe that yeah. hasn't existed in this sphere before, has some of this gone onto the frame set as well? In, in one way, obviously, just because we have our fork, uh, we wanted to make a geometry uh, that was dialed in for the fork. But that's, that's maybe not like a revolutionary, revolutionary thing. It's just a, a frame that fits really nicely onto a fork and works well in, in gravel. Uh, but then in terms of maybe material experience, we come from a different angle than, than other bike makers. Uh, so we have been using this material for a long time and have been yeah, learning lots, of, lots and lots of things uh, doing that. Interesting. Can we take a look at the frame? Yeah, yeah, let's go. Hammering technique leaves a bit to be desired. <laughs> so here it is, the true grit. Now this Skidberg's been out for like just under a year now, is that right? Yeah, a little bit under a year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and so your motivation for doing it, I guess, was to build the perfect frame around your force. Because I guess when you're adding in an element of suspension, the front of the bike has to lift up slightly to yeah, allow exactly. that front wheel to, to move. Yeah, exactly. So when we did the bike, we like you say, we started with the fork and descend out from that and it's a little bit longer than like rigid forks yeah because you have this little bit of suspension so it's about this one it has about 30 millimeters so it adds about maybe 20 millimeters to the actual to crown uh -huh. so it's a little bit taller instead of entering gravel from road bike side of things like you say we we ended from mountain bike side of things since we were mountain bikers so we have a longer top tube and shorter stems yeah uh, and then a slack head angle so actually, if I stuck a 135mm stem on that and a pair of flat handlebars, I'd basically be riding basically, the mountain bike yeah. I had back in the basically back in the <laughs> mid 90s. Yeah, <laughs> cable riding is uh, essentially tubes. So this frame is uh, it's kind of a new technology. The whole front triangle is a one piece. Uh, usually, you have joints around the head tube, joints around the seat tube, and bottom bracket, and then just tubes between. But this one is a one piece front triangle, and then. Uh, uh, the rear triangle. We are using simple, 
ideas and like reliable solutions. We go for like threaded bottom brackets, uh, easy internal routing. I, can, uh, I think I can hear people cheering in the comment yeah, section when you just mentioned threaded bit. bottom brackets. Well, you mentioned beer. Now I'm wondering whether this bike is like custom built for, for Dan Lloyd because there is a, a bottle opener where you would normally have a front derailleur. So, it, or is that like a standard? Yeah, gravel and beer kind of goes together. <laughs> yeah, so, so well, there we go. If anyone <laughs> is still not entirely sure about the benefits of one by, if you replace your front derailleur with a beer bottle opener, then maybe that's gonna convince you. I haven't unfortunately spent nearly enough time riding this bike or this fork, but I can certainly give you my first impressions because I was super intrigued to actually try this out for myself. And in use, it's maybe less about what you feel from the fork as what you don't feel. So I'm looking at the road and I'm seeing all the things that I would normally expect to then feel translated through the handlebars. And they just, they just don't really come to the handlebars. It's a bit like having a really, really soft tire from an absorption perspective, but yet with none of the squirm, none of the roll, and none of the actual damage to hitting your rims. So that probably would be my best synopsis of it. Clearly, you need to spend loads more time on it, but, but there we go, that's, that's what it feels like to ride in the short term. There is, however, one bit of this bike that we can thoroughly road test, and Goodberg, I believe you're gonna demonstrate for us right yeah. now the bottle opener. Full on. Okay. All right. Here you go, mate. Nice, thank you very much. And this is Homebrew? Homebrew, from the office. Fantastic, whoa, there we whoa. go. It's coming. Whoa, <laughs> quick. Well, there we go. Right, anyway, cheers, good break. Cheers. Wait, did you, did you wear shorts just to make me look like a complete, like, southern softy? It's kind of a practical joke to have around here for visitors. <laughs> <laughs> well, fair play for wearing shorts, because it is freezing cold. <laughs> okay, well, good work. Thank you so much for what, lending me a bike, let me take it for a spin, and also showing us around the HQ, and to Benedict as well. Thanks for coming over. Hey, no, it's nice cool, man. Around. We better wrap things up before the snow comes, because it certainly feels like uh, it's on its way. And you could put some trousers on as well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just to start <laughs> you start <laughs> your freezing up, you must be bitterly cold. Anyway, if you want to see some more from Iceland, then do make sure you check out the epic ride that Neil Donahue and I were able to go on. And also, before leaving, do make sure you give this a big thumbs up. Yeah.